Kichizuku's reviews, bringing you a southern perspective on books, movies, music, and much, much more. Stick around for a while, you just might hear something wicked. Well, hey again, friends. Welcome to episode 14. And we'll be continuing on with Thursday reads. And like I said, please forgive me for not being able to keep up this week. As I said in an earlier episode, I was not feeling well. So, for these reads, I'm going to continue with Nomad Love. And as you recall, this was the one that had the extremely strange artwork on the front. And I got this from Lavender Press. Chapter 5 The desert is beautiful. Very deadly, too. One day, death came, everywhere. The animals burst, bellies swollen, tongues burnt by the wind, eyes open as if refusing to die there in the middle of nowhere. Only a few birds left in the sky, beyond the reach of men. One after another, the sun snuffed out those old people who had been abandoned on the trail, half buried in the sand like the trunks of desiccated trees. One no longer took the trouble to dig a hole, cover the bodies with earth, place stones over them to protect against wild dogs. There was nothing left to fear. The dogs were dead too, eyes and belly split wide by the sun. The hot wind at times blew through their carcasses, pulling along the cries of birds. No one seemed to hear that music. No woman was in a mood to dance to it. Drained, they didn't even have enough strength left to cry for the children dying on their backs. They'd elected to carry them behind, refusing to see those tenderly accusing eyes. Born nomads, the children were gone. Mounted on their mothers, they'd left this desert behind. No water, no shade, no food. This land that life itself had left behind. Those men who still had the energy sucked the bitter, meager juice from some root, tearing fibers with their teeth. With angry eyes, others counted the dead. Still others quarreled over the shade of a palm tree, weakened, dropping their like wounded am and animals. They thought they saw the fingers of death hanging overhead, ready to seize them. The palm fronds had never seemed so close, so sharp. The men stayed there waiting, stretched out on the sand, heads on dry stone, mute, stock still. They were waiting on something, and they alone knew what it was. They alone knew they were expecting nothing. They stayed there hours on end, not speaking, seeing death in the sky, a thing they thought to be invisible. Once Takfine saw one of the men drag himself on his belly in order to die off by himself. Gone as far as he could, the man ground to a halt. Takfine's eyes also, right there on top of him, ground to a halt. The tracks the man left behind were like the ashes of a burned body. There must be a specific word for that. A word to describe a man burning slowly to death. Yet waiting in the shade of the palm, silent, motionless, perhaps this man had understood that death was there. He only needed to hold her off a bit by moving, moving ahead, advancing, walking with his hands, his belly, his eyes, whatever, just move. 
make some gesture, go forward, because life was there too, not somewhere else. There, in every little step, he could manage. Every hand, he could advance, always a little further. The least little piece of the way forward proved was still there, striking back at the enemy. No knife, no gun. With his bare hands, just his fingers ripping as many wounds into the desert as his body, dragging behind in the sand, was bandaging over. Tracks left in the sand like pieces of text. An eye looking down from above would have thought of a hand sliding over parchment, erasing a goodbye letter as fast as it was being drafted. Each day, the Beni Maruf, men, women, and children, left the place they'd been the day before, an entire tribe on the move. But death had passed by, too. There, where they were going, everywhere they looked, animal remains. The beasts still there, open, south winds softly whistling through pearly ribs. As for those who had gone on, straight on, trampling not even the tiniest blade of grass, not the tiniest droplet of water, the men knew they'd soon be reunited with the ravenous birds that swooped down to peck out their eyes. The most tenacious would fall a bit further on, convulsive, ungainly, dense, red meat swarming with little lives, as if wanting to go out that way, wanting to renounce its species and be born again as an army of worms, thousands of soldiers moving into its substance, attacking fiber by fiber. Now and then, there'd be a lot, live one up ahead, merely lost, wounded, weak, panic-stricken. It dropped to the ground, exhausted, exhausted, lips dribbling, then found its feet again, borne by some obscure liquid force drawn from its deepest arteries, from its bones, all the pride, muscle, marrow, and blood it had left, wild-eyed, half mad, hooves clattering in pursuit of some unseen enemy. It got back to its feet, only to sag and collapse, dislocated, neck broken, head shattered against a stone, tongue torn open. A moment later, it is lifted. It lifted its head a little, as if to make sure it wasn't completely dead, watching men go by who were watching back with the same intense, heavy eyes. Human beings on the march, and an animal on the ground, eyes locked, accomplices. What did it have to fear now from these men, condemned as they all were to feed the desert that refused to feed them? Soon it would be a beast among beasts. More animal than ever, no prayers, no funeral rites, no mourning, no, sheer, no tears shed. Legs splayed out, belly open, purple ribs like so many panpipes, for the wind to play on. All those hoofbeats across emptiness, the cries, the moaning, groaning, bawling. All that pain, that struggle, that suffering, transformed to soft music. And as a matter of fact, to see it from a distant line that way among the other beasts, among the dead. One would have said, but only from a distance, not trying to get closer, or get a better look, not touching, of course, those beasts there on the sand. Nearly sculptors, now. Hardly animals from a distance, these beasts. One would have said they looked like musical instruments abandoned by an orchestra in flight. The men walked days on end until they could walk no more, until they didn't even know how to walk anymore. They bore marks of injuries and wondered where these injuries had come from. These men had led no battles, joined in no fighting, carried no weapon. They left footprints in the sand, into which the women, afraid of getting lost, placed their feet as well. Starving, exhausted, they all walked bowed. Only the palm tree 
still held itself straight, imploring heaven, taking advantage of the hot wind to say its prayers with a slight nod of, it, of the head. Like the first letter of the alphabet, the alif, it took tall, it stood tall among those cur all those curves, those scattered dots, those broken lines. And that's it for chapter five. And we shall continue the next time around when we get back to No Man Bluff. So let's hurry and go ahead and speed through our next read for the night from the Oedipus Cycle of and um let's see where were we in it? We were within Oedipus Rex, the first scene. S scene one, Oedipus, is this your prayer? It may be answered, come, listen to me, act as the crisis demands, and you shall have relief from all these evils. Until now, now, I was a stranger to this tale, as I had been a stranger to the crime. Could I track down the murderer without a clue? But now, friends, as one who became a citizen after the murder, I make this proclamation to all Thebians. If any man know, knows by whose hand Lao, Laos, son of Labdakos, met his death. I direct that man to tell me everything, no matter what he fears for having so long withheld it. Let it stand as promise that no further trouble will come to him, but he may leave the land in safety. Moreover, if anyone knows the murderer to be foreign, let him not keep silent. He shall... Have his reward from me. However, if he does conceal it, if any man fearing for his friend or for himself disobeys this edict, hear what I propose to do. I solemnly forbid the people of this country, where power and throne are mine, ever to receive that man or speak to him, no matter who he is, or let him join in sacrifice, lustration, or in prayer, I decree that he be driven from every house, being, as he is, corruption itself to us. The Delphic voice of Zeus has pronounced this revelation. Thus I associate myself with the oracle and take the side of the murdered king. As for the criminal, I pray to God, whether it be a lurking thief or one of a number, I pray that that man's life be consumed in evil and wretchedness. And as for me, this curse applies no less. It sh if it should turn out that the culprit is my guest here, sharing my hearth, you have heard the penalty. I lay it on you now to attend to this for my sake, for Apollo's, for the sick, sterile city that heaven has abandoned. Suppose the oracle has had given you no command. Should this defilement go uncleansed forever, you should have found the murderer, your king, a noble king, had been destroyed. Now I, having the power that he held before me, having his bed, begetting children there upon his wife, as he would have. Had he lived, their son would have been my children's brother. If Laos had had luck in fatherhood, but surely ill luck rushed upon his reign. I say I take the son's part, just as though I were his son, to press the fight for him, and see it won. I'll find the hand that brought death to Labdakos' and Polydoros' child, heir of Cadmos and Agnor's line. And as for those who fail me, 
May the gods deny them the fruit of the earth, fruit of the womb, and may they rot utterly. Let them be wretched, as we are wretched, and worse. For you, for loyal Thebians, and for all who find my actions right, I pray the favor of justice and of all the immortal gods. Choragos. Since I am under oath, my lord, I swear I did not do the murder. I cannot name the murderer. Might not the oracle that has ordained the search tell where to find him? Oedipus. An honest question, but no man in the world can make the gods do more than the gods will. Torgos. There is one last expedient. Oedipus. Tell me what it is. Though it seems slight, you must not hold back. Torgos. A lord clairvoyant to the lord Apollo, as we all know, is the skilled... Tiresias. One might learn much about this from him, Oedipus. Oedipus. I am not wasting time. Creon spoke of this, and I have sent for him twice, in fact. It is strange that he is not here. Torgos. The other matter, that old report, seems useless, Oedipus. Tell me. I am interested in all reports. Torgos. The king said to have been killed by high women. Oedipus, I know, but we have no witnesses to that. Torgos. If the killer can feel a particle of dread, your, cur your curse will bring him out of hiding. Oedipus, no. The man who dared that act will fear no curse. Enter the blind seer. Tariq Rhesius. Led by a page, Chorgos. But there is one man who may detect the criminal. This is Tiresias. This is the holy prophet in whom alone all of all men truth was born. Oedipus. Tiresias, seer, student of mysteries of all that's taught and all that no man tells, secrets of heaven and secrets of the earth. Blonde though you are, you know the city lies, sick with plague. And from the, this plague, my lord, we find that you alone can guard or save us. Possibly you did not hear the messengers, Apollo, when we sent to him, sent us back with word that this great pestilence would lift, but only if we established clearly the identity of those who murdered Laos. They must be killed or exiled. Can you use bird flight or any art of div divination to purify yourself and Thebes and me from this contagion? We are in your hands. There is no fairer duty than that of helping others in distress. Tiresias. How dreadful knowledge of the truth can be when there is no help in truth. I knew this well, but made myself forget. I should not have come. Oedipus, what is troubling you? Why are your eyes so cold? Tiresias, let me go home. Bear your own fate, and I'll bear mine. It is better so. Trust what I say. Oedipus, what you say is ungracious and unhelpful to your native country. Do not refuse to speak. Tiresias, when it comes to speech, your own is neither temperate nor opportune. I wish to be more prudent. Oedipus, in God's name, we all beg you. Tiresias, you are all ignorant. No, I will never tell you what I know. Now it is my misery, then. It will be yours. Oedipus, what? You do know something and will not tell us. You would betray us all. And wreck the state? Tiresias, I do not intend to torture myself or you. Why persist in asking? You will not persuade me. Oedipus, 
What a wicked old man you are. You try a stone's patience. Out with it. Have you no feeling at all? Tiresias, you call me unfeeling. If you could only see the nature of your own feelings. Oedipus, why? Who would not feel as I do? Who could endure your arrogance towards the city? The Tiresias, what does it matter? Whether I speak or not, it is bound to come. Oedipus, then if it is bound to come, you are bound to tell me. Tiresias, no, I will not go on. Rage as you please. Oedipus, rage, why not? And I'll tell you what I think. You planned it. You had it done. You all but killed him with your own hands. If you had eyes, I'd say the crime was yours and yours alone. Tiresias, so, I charge you then. Abide by pro proclamation you have made. From this day forth, never speak again to these men or to me. You yourself are the pollution of this country. Oedipus, you dare say that. Can you possibly think you have some way of going free after such insolence? Tiresias, I have gone free. It is the truth that sustains me. Oedipus, who taught you shamelessness? It was not your craft. Tiresias, you did. You made me speak. I did not want to. Oedipus, speak what? Let me hear it again more clearly. Tiresias, was it not clear before? Are you tempting me? Oedipus, I did not understand it. Say it again. Tiresias, I say that you are the murderer whom you speak. Oedipus, now twice you have spat out infamy. You'll pay for it. Tiresias, would you care for more? Do you wish to really to be really angry? Oedipus, say what you will. Whatever you say is worthless. Tiresias, I say that you live in hideous shame with those most dear to you. You cannot see the evil. Oedipus, it seems you can go on mouthing like this forever. Tiresias, I can, if there is power and truth. Oedipus, there is, but not for you, not for you. You sightless, witless, senseless, mad old man. Tiresias. You are the madman. There is no one here who will not curse you soon as you curse me. Oedipus, you child of endless night, you cannot hurt me or any other man who sees the sun. Tiresias. True, it is not from me your fate will come. That lies within Apollo's competence, as it is his concern. Oedipus, tell me, are you speaking for Creon or for yourself? Tiresias, Creon is no threat. You weave your own doom. Oedipus, wealth, power, craft of statesmanship, kingly position, everywhere admired. What savage envy is stored up against these? If Creon, whom I trusted, Creon, my friend, for this great office which the city wants put in my hands unsought, if for this power Creon desires in secret to destroy me, he has brought his decrepit fortune teller, this collector of dirty pennies, this prophet fraud. Why, he is no more clairvoyant than I am. Tell us. Has your mystic mummery ever approached the truth? When that hellcat, the Sphinx, was performing here, what help were you to these people? Her magic was not for the first man who came along. It demanded a real exorcist. Your birds, what good were they? Or the gods, for the matter of that. But I came by Oedipus, the simple man, who knows nothing. I thought it out for myself. No birds helped me, and this is the man you think you can destroy? That you may be close to Creon when he's king. Well, you and your friend Creon, it seems to me, will suffer most if you were not 
an old man, you would have paid already for your plot. Torgos. We cannot see that his words or yours have been spoken except in anger, Oedipus. And of anger we have no need. How can God's will be accomplished best? That is what concerns us. Theresius. You are a king, but where arguments concerned, I am your man, as much as a king as you. I am not your servant, but Apollo's. I have no need of Creon to speak for me. Listen to me. You mock my blindness, do you? But I say that you will both... Your eyes are blind. You cannot see the wretchedness of your life, nor in whose house you live. No, nor with whom. Who are your father and mother, can you tell me? You do not even know the blind wrongs that you have done them on earth and in the world below. But the double lash of your parents' curse will whip you. Out of this land someday, with only night upon your precious eyes, your cries then, where will they be not be heard? What vastness of Kitharon will not echo them, and that bridal descant of yours, you'll know it then. The song they sang when you came here to Thebes and found your misguided birthing, birthing all this and more that you can not guess at now, will bring you to yourself among your children. Be angry then, curse Creon, curse my words. I tell you, no man that walks upon the earth shall be rooted out more horribly than you. Oedipus, I am to bear this from him? Damnation, take you, out of this place, out of my sight. Tiresias, I would not have come at all if you had not asked me. Oedipus, could I have told that you'd talk nonsense? That you'd come here to make a fool of yourself and of me? Tiresias, a fool? Your parents thought me the same. Your parents thought me sane enough. Oedipus, my parents again. Wait, who were my parents? Tiresias, this day will give you a father and break your heart. Oedipus, your infantile riddles. Your damn abracadabra. Tiresias. You were a great man once at solving riddles. Oedipus. Mock me with that if you like. You will find it true. Tiresias. It is true enough. It brought about your ruin. Oedipus. But it saved this town. Tiresias. To the page. Boy, give me your hand. Oedipus. Yes, boy. Lead him away. While you are here, we can do nothing. Go, leave us in peace. Tiresias, I will go when I have said what I have to say. How can you hurt me? And I'll tell you again. The man that you have been looking for all this time, the damned man, the murderer of Laos, that man is in Thebes. To your mind, he is foreign-born. But it will soon be shown that he is Thebian. A re revelation that will fail to please. Who has eyes now? A, penny a, a blind man. Who has his eyes now? A penniless man who is rich now. And he will go tapping the strange earth with his staff to the children with whom he lives now. He will be brother and father, the very same, to her who bore him, son and husband, the very same, who came to his father's bed, wet with his father's blood. Enough, go think that over. If later you find error in what I have said, you may say that I have no skill in prophecy. 
exit Tiresias, led by his page. Oedipus goes into the palace. So, what'd you think of that? There's lots to come in in this particular play, and it's quite gruesome. But we shall not reflect on that at the moment. But I would like you to think over the mystery of what's going on. So, I will be right back after this short break. Hopefully, I'll see you on the other side.
Hi, and welcome back. So, we shall be continuing in this segment with the Lowell Offering by Benita Eisler. And we left off in the introduction of the Millhouse Girls. And I'm going to back up about, let's say, about a paragraph. In 1831, Patrick Jackson, one of the Lowell partners, could boast to a tariff lobby group that was, that no less than 39,000 females had employment in the cotton manufacturer of the United States, earning wages amounting to upwards of four million dollars annually. The hard evidence was in daughter <clears throat> daughters are now empathetically a blessing to the farmer, and not only to the the farm their farmer fathers, shops, businesses, and suppliers sprang up in loyal Lowell and other small mill centers in the wake of this new consumer class. But it was Lowell, the Yankee El Dorado, whose idyllic beginnings summoned images of brand new glittering promise and profit. And the sense everywhere of youth, one could sw swear, marveled Dickens, that every bakery, grocery, and bookbindery, and every other kind of store, took its shutters down for the first time and started in business yesterday. The golden pestles and mortars fixed as signs upon the sunblind frames outside the druggists appear to have been just turned out in the United States Mint. And when I saw a baby of some week or ten days old in a woman's arms at the street corner, I found myself unconsciously wondering where it came from, never supposing for an instant that it would have been born in such a young town as that. If the owners did not boast, they readily conceded another advantage to this re ever-renewed supply of fresh female labor from the farms. The girls generally had homes and families to which they could return. If sickness, exhaustion, or the craving for a vacation overcame any girl after months of dawn-to-dusk labor, she would not be a charge on company payrolls or occupy a bed at one of the corporation hospital where care in any case was at the operative's expense as lowell did not have any charitable institution until the late 1850s there was no place for the non-productive who went home to the farm and sisters friends and neighbors swarmed to take the place of those who did not return Unlike their smaller, lower-paying competitors throughout New England, the Lowell corporations never had to advertise. They, empl they employed recruiting agents for the farther-flung regions. These may have lured some by exaggerated tales of idyllic factory life, but their primary role was providing transportation for the already converted glowing first-hand accounts such as the following report written by one of the girls to her sister back home on the new hampshire farm made sh shills superfluous since i have wrote you another payday has come around i earned fourteen dollars and a half nine and a half dollars besides my board the folks think I get along just first rate, they say. I like it well as ever, and Sarah and I don't and Sarah don't I feel independent of er everyone. The thought that I am living on no one is a happy one indeed to me. The young woman home for a visit provided the elegant evidence of new earning power. Rural girls 
who had rarely seen, let alone owned, paper money for the, could enjoy the fruits of their labor in the Lowell Mills, finery, savings, bank deposit books, and inconceivable until this moment in American history, their sense of independence. From the beginning, the Boston Associates had been aware that high wages alone would not convince God-fearing New England parents as they should permit their daughters to leave home to work in the mills. Yankee ingenuity would, therefore, provide a moral tariff against evils of the English mill system. Hence, the paternalism that characterized early mill owners as employers was shaped by two factors. First, the strongly held belief that ideal young women were particularly prone to depravity, making their employment itself a contribution to public morality. And second, a social phenomenon beyond public relations or even profit, the shared class and religious origins of labor and management. Both the Boston merchants and the yeoman fathers of the male girls were descendants of the Puritan settlers of New England. Furthermore, some mill owners were less than a generation removed from the same farmlands, which now yielded daughters to their corporate paternalism. Management, in turn, could boast of the wholesome influences which had produced these refined and superior young women. How could it otherwise... <clears throat> When these same influences had produced their own forebears, the facts of the rural life at this time were already quite different. Poverty, insanity, and alcoholism seemed to have been at least characteristic as the pastoral virtues. And there are some illustrations that I'll show you. Hold on just a moment. First one, James S. Brown's Patton Speeder from James Geldard Handbook on the Cotton Manufacturer, 1867, Steel Engraving, Loyal Lowell Museum Corporation. I think I think her her at this at this loom, she's so lovely, especially with her dress. Here's the next one. This says Merrimack Manufacturing Company, Lowell, Massachusetts. Cloth made and printed by Incorporated 1822 Warranted fast colors Cloth label of the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, Lowell, Massachusetts In use probably Common age 1845 to 1860 Merrimack Valley Textile Museum. Nostalgia has always been a good business in America. The Boston industrialist held that the superior daughters A pre-industrial New England produced, excuse me, a superior product. Labels for Lowell cotton goods depicted the neatly coiffed, trim young woman at her loom. This was the first time women employees were used to suggest the quality and refinement of the product. 
a public relations device the Bell Telephone Company would use so effectively 90 years later. But it remained for Francis, Francis Lowell's most significant innovation to give ultimate moral sanction to the entire enterprise. The Lowell corporations became generic. They were boarding house mills. From the outset, the Boston Associates could demonstrate re reassuringly to fearful fathers, doubtful divines, and radical reformers that their new factory system matched propriety of upbringing with the ex exemplary milieu their responsible stewardship provided. The Boston Manufacturing Company at Waltham had added boarding houses piecemeal to an already converted meal. In Lowell, this form of housing for single workers, along with tenements for families, was designed as an integral part of the corporations. Lowell thus became the first planned industrial community in the United States. With the first of the Lowell Mills, boarding houses were built on adjoining or nearby streets. As the overseer in the weavings or spinning room was responsible for the working habits and the conduct of the girls in his domain, the boarding house keeper, usually a respectable widow with a family, was answerable to the corporation for the moral and physical well-being of the girls in their hours outside the thick mill walls. Residents in the corporation boarding house was mandatory for unmarried female operatives, but it was partially subsidized, a rare form of capital capitalist benevolence. Though the girls were docked one twenty-five, one dollar and twenty-five cents of their weekly wage for board, the corporation was responsible for paying twenty-five cents a head to the boarding house keeper. Board meant three meals a day, a room with two or three beds, each shared by two or even three girls, and some laundry. A typical boarding house had from 25 to 30 tenants who adhered to, to a set of rules established by the corporation and enforced by the house mothers. Every aspect of the boarders' life outside working hours was made accountable by these rules, which regulated curfews, candles, and visitors. In addition, compulsory church attendance was part of the contract each girl signed for the building of churches and their support by the contribution of the mill girls had been foreseen as essential to the daughters of the Congregationalists and Universalist New England. Initially, the boarding houses were well-maintained establishments whitewashed outside and painted within each spring at the corporation expense. There would even appear to have been lively competition among the house mothers to set the best lively best table since the girls could choose among several houses belonging to a corporation. Anthony Trollope, on a trip to America, visited the boarding houses and was impressed by the substantial meals. Not only was the meat served twice a day, but hot meat. He went on to observe, however, that for the curiously carnivorous Americans to live eat a day without meat would be a great privation as to pass a night without a bed. Descriptions of menus by the girls themselves, moreover, bear witness to the heartiness of the meals, as well as to the appetites of the consumers. For dinner, meat and potatoes with vegetables, tomatoes, and pickles, pudding or pie with bread, butter, coffee or tea. Criticism of the houses focused on poor ventilation, exacerbated by overcrowding. Harriet Martineau, that most acute of English observers, was appalled and mystified by the lack of privacy. This was the understandable lot of the poor in a small country like England.
in America, where space is far less consequence, where the houses are large, where the factory girls can build churches and buy libraries and educate brothers for learned professions. These same girls have no private apartments and sometimes sleep six or eight in a room and even three in a bed. Other critics went further, noting dirt and vermin in the bedrooms, not surprising since bathing facilities were min minimal. It is very likely, however, that large families in backcountry farms at home offered the girls more or even as much in the way of privacy and amenities. One Manchester mill girl was overcome by the unfamiliar luxury of her very pleasant front room reflecting reflecting that it seems funny enough to be boarding. I don't even have my bed to make. Quite a lady to be sure. The function of the boarding house as an instrument for surveillance and moral policing was clear in terms of intent. Less clear was how well the system worked to these ends. One house mother, whose daughter Harriet Hansen later was a contributor to the offering, was turned out of her boarding house along with her family because the 11-year-old Harriet, then a bobbin girl, had followed the older workers out of the mill during a turnout. If Miss Hansen could not control her boarders, the company agent explained, she must at least bear responsibility for the behavior of her own child. Obviously, the political role of the boarding house system identifying organizers of strikes or turnouts in the 1830s, or proponents of the 10-hour movement in the 1840s depended on the loyalties of the housekeeper, but not on her alone. The corporations could never have foreseen the role of the boarding house as incubator of peer group pressure and closely knit community of female workers living together created new values solidarity and political activism the growth of the 10-hour movement within the mills and the proliferation of questions directed to the issue of operatives health all pointed to one fact conditions in both the mills and the boarding houses were steadily deteriorating the lower working day had gradually been extended from an average of 11 hours as shown on the timetable reproduced on page 30 to more than 13 hours a day. However, poor the, however, poor the ventilation might have been in the boarding house, it was much worse in the mills, where the air was polluted with flying lint and fumes from the whale oil lamps that hung on pegs from each loom. Moreover, to maintain the humidity required to keep threads from breaking, the air had to be sprayed regularly with water and the windows nailed shut. Such an atmosphere undoubtedly aggravated the vulnerability of lungs exposed everywhere to tuberculosis, the white death, that ravaged urban and rural America alike throughout the 19th century. What percentage of the high turnover rate as high as 40% in some mills, was attribute, attributable to girls going home to die. As reformers regularly asserted, will never to be known. In vaccinating the operatives against smallpox at company expense, the Boston magnates passed for enlightened philanthropists. Such corporate concern for the health of employees was unheard of beyond the borders of Massachusetts. But defensiveness increased answers to questionnaires devised by corporation apologists, both medical and pastoral, for the boarding housekeepers in 1841 and 1845 proved not astonishingly that the health of the operatives was to stick statistically no worse for having worked four years in the mills 
Like most statistical studies today, the same data were promptly cited by adversaries of the factory system to prove the reverse. The most vocal defender of the salubrious nature of millwork not only protested too much, but went further, blaming such ill health as might exist on the girls themselves, the Reverend Henry Miles noted. Some come with the seeds of disease already growing within them, and they find that their constitutions would soon break down by the continued labor. Others, freed from the guardianship of parental care, are greatly imprudent in their diet or dress or exposure to cold and damp air. Others still will feel that devotion to fashion, which is characteristic of the sex, and will contract a serious, perhaps fatal cold through neglect to provide themselves with a warm shawl or a pair of stout shoes. More, there is something in the monetary uh, monotony of mill life which seems to beget a morbid hankering for little artificial stimulants of the appetite and the tone of the stomachs is frequently deranged by foolish and expensive patronage of the confectioner. Whether they left the mills for health or husbands in protest or with the certainty of better jobs elsewhere, by the beginning of the Civil War, the presence of the Yankee farm girls was mere, was mere memory of 7,000 women operatives in 1836. Less than 4% had been foreign born. By 1860, 61.8% of Lowell's workforce were immigrants, almost half of whom were Irish. The first generation of Lowell Mill girls was also the last WASP labor force in America. And we shall continue the next time we, are, we, we visit this set of rings. So, you should already know I'm about to take a short break to be able to get a sip of coffee and um, probably run and have a potty parade real quick. So, you do that and I will be right back after this break. Hope to catch you then.
All right. Welcome back. And we shall continue today for one of my requests that every that I have one user that is looking forward to is the Gnostic Bible. And as you can see, this is an enormous book. It's going to take us some time to get through this. And as boring as it might seem, the introductions are important. Especially when you, it comes to very heavy texts such as the Gnostic Bible. You need to read the introductions. So, we shall continue the introduction written by Marvin Mayer, which, uh, if you recall, we already had one introduction. This particular introduction is concerning part one, Early Wisdom Gospels. In the beginning was wisdom, Akuma, Sophia, one of the earliest forms of exalted expression in the world of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern antiquity was wisdom. Wisdom can be both the product of experience and the gift of the gods. Wisdom is that is what the father teaches the son, the parent the child, the sage, the student. Though wisdom teaches, though wisdom and knowledge, people learn how to speak and act among family and friends and foes in social encounters, in the political arena, on the street. Through wisdom and knowledge, people learn about the world and the ways of the world and how to cope with it. Through wisdom and knowledge, People address the ultimate questions. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the good suffer? And what is the end of human life? Is this all there is? Ancient Sages and Wisdom Literature From the times of the ancient Egyptians and Mesopotamians, Wisdom and knowledge have been seen as keys to a good and successful life. So in Egypt, an old sage under the name of... I don't know how to say this, so... Ptahotep. Ptahotep. Offers advice to his son with everyday observations and clever turns of speech. Do not let your heart be puffed up because of your knowledge. Do not be confident because you are wise. Take counsel with the ignorant as well as the wise. The full limits of skill cannot be attained, and there is no skilled person equipped to full advantage. Good speech is hidden more than the emerald, but it may be found with young women at the grindstones. Again, if you are a leader commanding the affairs of the multitude, seek out for yourself every beneficial deed until it may be your own affairs are without wrong. Justice is great, and its appropriateness is lasting. It has not been disturbed since the time of the one who made it. Where is... Whereas there is punishment for one who passes over its laws, the strength of justice is that it lasts. In ancient Mesopotamia, wisdom is also praised, often as a gift of the gods. In one text, an unnamed sage praises wisdom and the divine lord of wisdom, here understood to be Mar Marduk, god of Babylon, whose way is both terrible and gentle. I will praise Marduk, the lord of wisdom, the deliberate god who lays hold of the night but freezes, frees the day, whose fury surrounds him like a storm wind, but whose breeze is as pleasant as a morning zephyr, 
whose anger is irresistible, whose rage is a devastating flood, but whose heart is merciful, whose mind forgiving, whose hands the heavens cannot hold back, but whose gentle hand sustains the dying. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, wisdom was the domain of the philosopher, the lover of wisdom and knowledge, who dispenses wisdom and knowledge. Those philosophers with cynic or cynic pro proclivities, so named for their rough dog-like lifestyles, employ witty sayings with a cynic bite in order to teach the good and noble life. Thus, Marcus Porcius Cato, when asked why he was studying Greek literature after his 18th year, said, not that I may die, learn it, but that I may not die unlearned. And the path Pythagorean philosopher Theano, when asked by someone how long it takes after having sex with a man or for a woman to be pure to go to Thesmorphia, Thesmophoria, said, if it is with her own husband at once, but if with someone else's, never. And again, when Diogenes, the cynic philosopher, saw a country boy, country boy scooping up water in his hand in order to drink, he threw away the cup that he was carrying in his bag and said, Now I can be this much lighter. In the world of early Judaism, sages are revealed, revered for their insight into the human condition before God, and sometimes the wisdom they proclaim is personified as Hakama in Hebrew or Sophia in Greek. Terms of feminine gender is used to indi indicate Wisdom as the female expression of the divine. The figure of wisdom in Judaism echoes the earlier goddesses of wisdom in other tradition. Mot in Egypt, Ishtar in Mesopotamia. And wisdom's career continues through the Gnostic texts published in the present volume. In Proverbs, wisdom herself is said to raise her voice. O oh, people, to you I call out and raise my voice to all the living. You, the simple, learn prudence, acquire intelligence, you, the foolish. Listen, for I have noble things to say, and from my lips will come what is right. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. Wisdom is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. I, wisdom, live with prudence and possess knowledge and discretion. The Lord brought me forth, and as the first of his works, the first of his acts of old, ages ago I was set up, at the beginning before the world began. I was at his side like a master worker, and was filled with delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in his people. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, 10 through 12, 22 through 23, and 30 through 31. This ancient wisdom, which provided Ideas of how people might live with insight, virtue, and happiness proved to be compelling, and wisdom sayings were communicated both by word of mouth and in written form. In an ancient world, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Greco-Roman, and Jewish books of wisdom were compiled and circulated widely. 
The wisdom literature of an ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia dates back to the second and third millennia BCE. That means before Common Era, which with collections of wisdom sang by sages such as Menahat. Uh, uh, Amen Mape Patakwe Shurpak and Ahikar. The Sinic sayings from Greco Roman times were collected in textbooks called the Pro 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 Nasmata. These sayings were called ch Cherei, useful sayings, and they were judged useful for rhetorical instruction and for the conduct conduct of life. Though the pro. Gymnasmata were used within educational systems into the Byzantine period and far beyond, even into the modern world. In educational systems in Europe and the American colonies, Jewish wisdom literature is included within the Hebrew Bible and elsewhere. Some of the prominent books of Jewish wisdom are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, the Wisdom of Solomon, and the Sirach, as well as the Tractic Perky Aboth, saying of the fathers, which is included in the Talmud. So, next time around, we will continue with the section on Jesus, the Jewish sage. So, I really hope you're looking, you will look forward to it, and we will finish the introduction, or this... The introduction to the first part when we will revisit the Gnostic Bible. But I really hope you enjoyed episode 14 of Wicked Suzuki's Reviews. If you have any questions or if you have any suggestions on my pronunciation on some of these words, please send me uh, an email at wikishizuku at gmail.com. You can find my announcements at Telegram under Wikishizuku's Reviews. And you can DM me at Twitter at Sam Lynn Toll. And until next time, have a good evening. Be safe. Be kind. And love each other. Thanks for watching.